So I'd like to introduce Dr. John Rudmack yeah. from a holy name uh, medical center in New Jersey, interventional radiologist, and I'd like to thank him and his team for putting together a couple of exemplary live cases this morning. Welcome, John. Good morning, and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. We're actually here at the Vascular Anesthesia Prevention, which is our outpatient uh, lab. Uh, I apologize, I'm not as animated as I often am. I had my third booster, on my first booster, that shot yesterday, and I'm definitely feeling it. So, you sure will do it. You will be wary of the consequences. I'm very happy to have you as a partner, Dr. Kevin Herman. I am here with his behind me. Andre, Andre Harris, who's our uh, tech engineer there. Often, often, often he gets the access and does much of the chat about us. We're working later. Later is working our um, CR, CR over there. there. And Diane, yeah. our patient yeah. service aide and nurse. So, so uh, she's yeah. over the other side monitoring the patient. So uh, thank, thank, you, thank you to the team here at the North End of Basketball. We have two cases today. One is the SFA occlusion, TTO. We can only classify it. a little hard to screen without sound. That's our goal. In this case, first the first case, which is a patient with common coronary artery disease. So in brief, brief it's a 77 year old guy with high two diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, prior smoking. Um, who actually had, had a lateral stage SFA uh, intervention. intervention. And after, and after that, a uh, persistent uh, uh, category, category three patient, patient and numbness and night in his right leg. Uh, and we went back at that point and did some uh, arterial duplex, which I don't have right here, and showed that it's calcified common femoral stenosis. Interpreted is about 80% or so with a fair amount of calcium, and he was in sort of monophasic low then. I think the original duplex, we didn't quite appreciate it with the SFA occlusion, um, you know, which probably gave kind of a altered pulse configuration at that common thermal. Uh, you guys still hear me okay? I don't, I'll stop getting my feedback. Yeah, I mean, we've got a little bit of an echo going. Um, uh, we're trying to work it out on our end uh, in terms of the echo. But I guess in short, uh, you, you've got a patient, uh, couldn't quite understand, you had a patient with SFA occlusion and concomitant common femoral disease. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, so interestingly, we didn't appreciate the extent of the common femoral artery disease. And I think when you do, you know, imaging on these patients, duplex imaging, when you have SFA occlusion, uh, sometimes you can underestimate the common femoral disease. You sort of have a water hammer configuration to that, and you think there's more downstream disease. So I don't know if it's that or it's the progression of common femoral artery disease over the six months, but clearly he's remained symptomatic after that SFA intervention. Uh, so our goal today is to target that uh, common thermal. If you can go to full screen uh, input one, I'm going to show you what we've done so far. And how long do we have, PK? I'm sorry, I, I can't kind of hear you. Oh, yep, now I see your screen. Uh, how long do we have total? Uh, you've got one hour, John. It's uh, your, your session ends at oh. uh, 9.25. Good, so there'll be plenty of just time for discussions. As you know, these are not necessarily very lengthy interventions. So, uh, so this is what we've done so far. So far. Most of our uh, access, and I'm sure we all share this belief, is with ultrasound. Uh, he's got a, a fairly large uh, panis. Uh, it was a little bit hard to see the common femoral. He had the prior stent there. So you can see I've uh, used that stent and the calcification of the common femoral artery is a landmark for fluoroscopic guided puncture. And this is a 21 gauge micropuncture needle. Uh, we've gone ahead and gotten uh, access, as you can see there, with the 0.01 inch uh, guide wire. Uh, and then we've uh, gone ahead and we've, uh, let me jump ahead here. Uh, we introduced our catheter, and this is contrast. So we're using mostly CO2 on him. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the CO2 mander, but because his belly is pretty big, uh, we couldn't see much of the CO2 in the abdomen. So this is a little bit of contrast for the aortic bifurcation to guide us. Uh, we didn't easily hook over that bifurcation. I think that's mostly bowel gas at that uh, common left. We're going to have to assess that clearly uh, at some point if we get some additional uh, pictures. A little aneurysm on the left. Uh, common iliac as well, left leg is completely uh, asymptomatic. Um, and then we sort of look down, uh, we go ahead, we get our uh, our catheter uh, over, uh, and uh, once we get our catheter over, we exchange for, in this case, a seven French cross over sheet. And we can do these interventions with a six, but as Dr. Herman astutely pointed out, it's nice to have a seven in in case you have to double wire the placenta or something like that. So uh, plus it gives you more flexibility over the bifurcation, introducing various devices, and that may be relevant. Our plan here is to do a uh, extirpative or cutting atherectomy with the Hawk one device, and the extra space in that sheath definitely facilitates that. So this is a 730 sheath, which we brought over the bifurcation. And one more contrast run, I think there you can sort of very much appreciate the lesion. Uh, I think we're gonna appreciate it more as we get to the intravascular ultrasound. Uh, it will really show us, you know, luminally how bad this is. But, uh, you know, uh, again, this is symptomatic and by, by external duplex ultrasound, 
is a very, very relevant lesion. So at this point, we switched over to CO2. You can sort of see the difference. You can appreciate the lesion there again. This is just a little steeper oblique. The first was 30. This is 45 degree. You can see that prior SFA stent is well positioned osteally in the SFA. Profunda is uh, open, particularly the end of this. When you sort of get washed out. You kind of see how that, that really is a compromised lumen, I think. And uh, we'll see it more with the IBIS. You can see that these are prior biomimic stents that we uh, have here. Let me see if I can sort of put some bone in to show those uh, uh, to you. Um, it's this button right here. Yeah, so you can see those uh, biomimic stents and not sure why we had that gap in the stent, but you know, it's not uncommon. You know, we used to do confluence stenting of these. Now we kind of do entry and exit when we're sub Um And you'll see in a minute, this is not such a straightforward SFA intervention. This is actually a rendezvous procedure done with uh, contralateral thermal access as well as retrograde uh, pop kill access. And I think here's the giveaway right there. You see, uh, in trying to get anti-grade initially, we uh, got uh, some extra luminal uh, contrast. Uh, so we uh, were in a false channel. We coiled that. We thought we were doing pretty well, you know, doing our knuckle wire and intraluminal uh, recanalization, sort of a SOGA technique. But we saw that we were extra luminal, so we coiled that lumen, pulled that back, and at that time, now we can retrograde from the P3 pop anterior, which is in poach I like. Uh, plus, in this case, you'll see in a minute, it was necessitated by the single vessel perineal runoff. So uh, once we did that, we were able to achieve our rendezvous back then and uh, complete the intervention. Again, these uh, look pretty good. They're about four or five months uh, old. Now these uh, mimics and still early. But really nice, not too much uh, uh, interval hyperplasia in these at all. Well, well so yeah. here's the runoff. And you can see we sort of stopped at this point, essentially single vessel runoff. You know, there's, we haven't looked a little bit uh, lower, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of uh, maybe some uh, anterior tibial over there, but uh, you know, the single vessel perineal. So for a variety of reasons, I'd love to sort of get the panel opinion on this, you know, we're going to uh, go ahead and evaluate this common femoral with IVIS and treat from there. We like a strategy of uh, cutting atherectomy, extirpative atherectomy of the hawk, uh, and we're going to hopefully be able to showcase now the Separa stents in this location since the United States, we just recently have available the largest size Separa stents. So, uh, I've been putting the available six and a half Separa stents in common femoral, even though they've been undersized, particularly as they extend into the external iliac. Um, but it's nice to have the availability of common thermal uh, stents. Well, not dedicated, but the largest size stents to be able to showcase that here tonight. Uh, we're going to use some uh, distal embolic protection with a spider filter since we're going to be doing some cutting out directly. I don't think we're going to have to do a second wire that profunda, but I'd love to sort of get your opinion and the panel's opinion about what their strategies might be. Uh, we use a Medina classification, which is, you know, a hyphenated classification where there's involvement of the external iliac, profunda femoral, and SFA. So uh, if I go back, just for a moment, and we sort of take a look again at that common femoral. Uh, I think this is essentially limited to the common femoral and maybe a little bit external. So this is gonna, right there, that's fine. So I think that this is gonna be a one, zero, zero. The most common pattern is a one, 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 um, which is uh, also an azima type three, which involves the Splenda and SFA. But this is good. So theoretically, we can, when we complete this, try to land our uh, comparison above the bifurcation, not have to cross that Splenda. Although it's been pretty innocuous to do that. Okay. Well, well that's a, so that's a great background. Yep, that's a great plan, and I think you've got a great panel here. Um, obviously, the, I think some of the lectures uh, interspersed between your your you case are, are going to be about the SFA CTOs. So it's going to be a little bit different for the for the audience, but I think that you know it should be no problem. Okay. So I'm just going to ask the panel, and you've More got a great panel. CTO. You've got you've got Dr. Caraccio, Dr. Di Robertis, <laughs> Dr. Dr. Bianchi. Dr. Jenkins and Dr. Tamala. So, 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 Brian, I was just asking you, in these type of common femoral uh, femoral sure. lesions, I mean, nice. when, when when do you choose to, uh, as a surgeon, you know, intervene uh, with a, uh, a percutaneous approach versus a, uh, a surgical approach? And and what exactly is your is your thought process of using intravascular imaging to help you guide uh, your therapy? Yeah, good questions. I, I think that there's um, luckily there's a lot of techniques and devices we now have that will work pretty well in a common femoral. Uh, I, I prefer the exact strategy that uh, Dr. Runback has outlined here, excisional atherectomy, which I usually will pair with DCB. Um, some of the problems with the, with the common femoral, as you know, from operating on it, it's it's a, a very a coral reef-like exophytic calcific plaque, and you can imagine that can be difficult to debulk fully. And if uh, and if so, then, then uh, superostents are a good option. And I do think there's growing data for this. There's even some small randomized trials now that are looking at this. But I, I, I guess I would caution everyone in 
to bear in mind that the exactly. data we have on common femoral endorectomy, which is still a relatively small operation that could even be done under local, um, those operations have 10 and 20 year outcomes, you know, which is not something we have for percutaneous intervention. So if it's isolated, bulky, exophytic plaque in the common femoral, I think most of us surgeons still prefer uh, open surgery for that. Right. And then does uh, mm -hmm. Alfie, any comments on intravascular yeah. imaging? Does it help you guide? Uh, Hey, we are Brian. I wish you a bird. Let's go ahead and get this advantage out. It's a risk for embolizing or something else. Go ahead and load it. Sometimes in a full proof. I think we'll go here. Let's go ahead and load it. But if it's a re op, if there's an obese patient or something else like that, same thing. I actually directional atherectomy for something like that. And I would try, he upsized the sheet. I would try filtering both. I, I'm just biased. I hate losing a profunder if necessary. And if it's a chunk of calcium getting and it gets wedged, sometimes it's not so easy to get well, out. Get right. So Dr. Jenkins, about distal protection. I mean, Dr. Rumbach decided to use distal protection. Is that something you commonly use? Is there any algorithm that you personally follow in this kind of lesions? Well, I'll answer that question, but I want to make another comment. And I think it's mandatory to use distal protection in all of these. And you should also realize that all of these atherectomy companies will tell you that a lot of them that you don't need distal protection. Their microns of debris is less than capillaries, et cetera. But don't believe any of that. You need to protect all of these, period, end of the story. But my question is, is not that I'm becoming conservative, not that I'm getting conservative in my old age, I'm 60, <laughs> but I am sitting next to two surgeons which have boots on and they can kick me. And the question is, um, this John you see is using uh, CO2. Uh, obviously, this patient, I couldn't hear all the history. I apologize for the audio. But uh, this patient obviously has CKD of some kind or he wouldn't be using CO2 imaging. And so in a patient who has comorbidities that may point you towards uh, renal issues, uh, why would you not? Uh, and, and again, as PK knows, we've been doing intervention on the CFAs for 25, 30 years at Oshner, even written uh, data on it. And, you know, I was an early proponent of it uh, back when I used to get kicked by the surgeons all the time. But still, why would you not consider a simple cut down in an accessible region in a patient who may suffer consequences from this contrast? So, so, John, there's a question about, uh, you know, surgical evaluation for a patient uh, with common femoral disease. Uh, just what are the comorbidities of the patient or, or your thought process as to why uh, endo uh, with, with possible stenting may be the option for you? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, I think all of you are familiar with the VMI data. And, you know, that was obviously banner work that was done by King Deleuze in Belgium. Uh, I haven't seen anything since 2019, which is the 24-month data. But, you know... Uh, Kuhn using uh, the uh, uh, Sotera stents in this location uh, has done remarkably well. I mean, uh, two-year primary patency is uh, 93%. Freedom for repeat intervention is uh, 97%. Um, and uh, essentially, obviously, no wound complications, which is the Achilles heel of surgical endorectomy, particularly in a chronic kidney disease population with a kind of more predisposed to wound infection. So, you know, my personal bias is, is that um, this is going to be the way to go increasingly moving forward, you know, um, you know, with exceptions where there may be extraordinarily large or bulky disease uh, that uh, prevents successful outcome. Uh, please keep it in for one. We don't need the camera. Enough. I think it's those are good one. points. I mean, I mean, Christian, um, I mean, you know the data very well. And, and the question of, um, uh, you know, the, these, what type of data do we really need uh, in forms of trials or whatever it may be? Is it a head-to-head -head comparison in a randomized control fashion? What 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 would, what would you need if to say that endovascular needs to found can become a true point. option? Sure, I think like everything Put else, the guidelines uh, usually lag behind current edgy practitioners. Into I would say this is an edgy intervention uh, for most of us who are guideline driven. This is for the surgical lesion, minimal morbidity, under local anesthesia, excellent outcome, excellent protection devices or clamps. Although this has stents distal to the potential clamps or clamping the stent, it can be done safely. The profunda protection to me is number one in terms of potential risk of this particular approach, but it can be done. A head-to-head -head comparison, I don't think it will ever get done. I think what we need to focus is the current randomized controlled trial with very short uh, um, evaluation in terms of patency, uh, does it include or does not include what patient population. So this would be included, but there are common femoral, long segment, highly calcified occlusions that would not be amendable. So there's always gonna be a role for endorectomy 
in this uh, that again, material I want to make sector. That a little bit so I think dangerous. the the peer pressure of endovascular technologies will continue to advance, yeah, and we'll see a more of a role of endovascular approach yeah, with a proper biomimetic. Uh, I think stent is the way to go in terms of maintaining patency is the highest class evidence for it. So I think that's going to be probably uh, the, the way to go in, in terms of endovascular approach to this segment. One well, of the points about distal protection is you can protect the right? SMFA, but you're not protecting the profunda if you're using an atherectomy device. A surgical approach protects both. But but I will be uh, you know curious about these uh, cardiology techniques and in, in bifurcation management. Can we apply them into this right? measure? No, right. Those things? Yes. Good points. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, John, there's a question about uh, bifurcation involving the profunda. Uh, we know that in, in Kuhn's data, it didn't seem to make as much of a difference, although there was a little reduced patency if the profunda was, was involved. So, I mean, in this case, obviously, it's the ideal case. You have no profunda involvement. But if you did have profunda involvement, would that change uh, your, your strategy in terms of how you would deal with this? Or would you still continue uh, uh, doing, uh, doing a, um, you know, an endovascular mod modality? Yeah, I mean, you know, there are a number of uh, you know publications on this, the Azima data and uh, obviously Kuhn's data and others as well. I should even talk on this. It doesn't seem to matter too much. And we obviously that profunda is a lifeline, but the reality of it is that uh, even when you bridge the profunda with the superior sense, uh, very rarely does it uh, compromise the profunda well, at least not two years follow up, as you left this. And you know, there are no schema complications uh, related to uh, that that we're in. As Cohen has also pointed out, you know, if you should need surgery, the unique thing about these, you know, these uh, woven, uh, interwoven night small stents is that they can be relatively easier to move that surgery. So uh, they kind of peel right out. Uh, so if there's not a reasonable solution or the fund is compromised with concerns, there is a means of surgical options, which obviously uh, is an important, you know, bailout. Got it. Al? I don't yeah. know if you saw that IBIS. Maybe play back that uh, recording that we had. I don't know if you guys were sort of watching. No, we, we were watching. We just, yeah. It. It'd be good if you could go over that IVIS with us. Yeah, so it was about, it's a measure about seven or or so, and the external really asked that SFA is uh, about six, six and a half. And uh, as you pull back, there's an interesting read. I mean, how do you pause it at times? Just, just go one at a time, just pause it, pause it. <laughs> so already you can see that sort of compromise there. And, just sort of go with your uh, pen, just sort of slide, use a slider bar, and go down a little bit, keep going, keep going. And it was really interesting because there's a, uh, it's almost, I don't want to the dissection, but you can sort of see there, I don't know if that's the funder coming off, it was above that level. We were above the funder. It's just sort of funny that lesion that there seems to be, you know, evidence of plaque prolapse essentially into that lumen. Uh, as we come up a little bit higher, you can sort of see other areas, look how severely compromised that is. So, um, you know, I think that the, Duplex estimate of this being a 80% lesion is really accurate. Yeah, that's great that you have both physiologic and anatomic now, um, you know, identification of this plaque. And the morphology is also very clear. Obviously, it looks like ruptured plaque we go to, uh, uh, with, uh, with one, a lot of uh, heavy plaque burden. Alfio, you had something to say? Yeah, I had a question. In particularly if you're using the IVIS and you debulk it enough that you get back up to your standard lumen, aside from patency, the trade off is accessing. Small vessel, I mean, small sheath access with the supera, any stent in the groin isn't terrible, but there's been issues okay, with large right access. So I'm curious to what the other panelists and PK yourself, that Christian, what you think of um, accessing the groins after stent placement. So, so John, I mean, uh, well, just a question well, on, on, on are, access. Are, don't move it. So uh, well, right. while you do the atherectomy, can you describe the, uh, the atherectomy that you're going to do right now and, and what your technique is? All right. Yeah. We turn off the back. Turn the back. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. So obviously, I'm a little wary of these stents. I think they're well endothelialized. We're going to sort of be careful as we get to right there and not push that. Okay. Good. All right. Close it. All right. So really, you want to only kind of activate this sort of going forward there. I did back off that a little bit. So we're going to do four quadrant uh, atherectomy. That was the medial side. I'm just going to rotate this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll try to do that. So I don't know if he's anterior or posterior, but. Again, really sort of slow, you know, of course. So, so Dr. Like Tamala, there, there's oh, a little good. concern, a little bit about cutting the uh, carina of the profunda, I mean, profunda. And I know that Lateral. Dr. McKinsey, good. who does a lot of these, is always worried about that, you know, cutting that particular carina. Any, any, any experience okay. on your hands about that? Yeah, I think uh, 
I, I'd be worried about it. Obviously, maybe a flap or something yeah. prolapsing into that profunda origin. I mean, but that it's close. tough to put a safety guide wire in it if you're going to do yeah. direct yeah. line. Exactly. So I think that's the key. I think the other thing, too, the ladder, is the so was really informative here, if you think about it. We've got two channels. It's almost like fenestrated, but it's, you know, it's an eccentric plaque that's prolapsing into the lumen. Yeah, it didn't look fine. as heavily calcified as I expected it to look based mm -hmm. on the angiographic or fluoroscopic assessment. So then that leads you to, to think to yourself, well, my other option here is shockwave, lithotrip, lithotripsy, followed by POBA, DCB, et cetera. But I think after the IVIS, I was more convinced that I would go with directional athletics. Case if I was so I think the IVIS was very key here, and I think it really helped direct uh, treatment in this case. Great points. And to answer Alfio's question, Alfio, the, um, the, there has been uh, case reports of actually TAVRs done through Supera stents because uh, being in like a slinky type configuration, the right. stents actually open up and close. But obviously what your point is, oh, long-term access of, of uh, you know, in these stents and how they're gonna do down the road, I don't think there's enough data for us. So, CO2, unless so there's a question from the audience. Can you go to the microphone? Mm -hmm. Actually, it's similar to the question that you asked. I saw he accessed the um, stent and I just wanted to know, you know, is there kind of stents that should avoid accessing like via bonds, for example? How do you deal with closure after you access this time? Brian, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, you can still, well, for Supera, it's pretty easy to, to reaccess. Um, any, any nitinol stent you can reaccess through. I'm, I'm not sure I've ever reaccessed through a, uh, through a, a Viabon or a covered stent, but any for other one? nitinol stent, even Supera, you can access through it and dilate it up to a six yeah, without cool. too much trouble. I think where you're limited is closure devices. My closure device of choice is a per close. And that can have you can have trouble deploying that in a um, in a, through a supera I know, um, but other closure devices like Minx or or Angus Hill will work fine there. So the only difference in accessing a groin that has a stent in it versus one that does not is you do not have to use ultrasound. Yep. So so John, we're just gonna while you're working and doing Perfect. an IVIS, yeah. we're gonna go to our first lecture from Dr. Finelli. Uh, he's gonna okay. talk a little bit about vessel preparation, but for CTOs, but I think it's gonna be quite relevant uh, to this as well. So John, uh, if you could just give us a quick update. We've got two more lectures to go into before sure. you deploy the Supera. Yeah. Can you well, just show us the post IVIS? We show the overhead camera, to show the overhead camera very quickly, if you can, just to show you what we removed with the uh, aspirectomy. You can zoom that in if you want. So it was a uh, four quadrant. Probably could have been more aggressive when we look back at ultrasound. There were, you could see that there were definitely some good cuts. But again, you know, uh, we're just trying to uh, debulk this zoom up. I'll show the picture. Thank you. All right. So you can see a sense of water moves there. If you go back to uh, full screen input one. Um, so I thought we had some good cuts. We did balloon inflation. I think you uh, saw that. That was, uh, it went nominal essentially at four atmospheres. That was a seven millimeter balloon. Uh, we took it to nominal. Uh, which was uh, uh, 10 atmospheres for two minutes. And now uh, we did not look at IVIS scan, but we've sort of, you know, we've marked our line to gain. Uh, if you use a football term, we're going to go ahead and deploy that Supera stand to get durable results. So, okay. All right. Can, uh, so, so why don't you go ahead? Uh, can you show us the IVIS post before you deploy the Supera? Um, well, I think Dr. Herman started, so I'll show it to you. Okay, that's fine. Have you, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, Alfie, you have a question? Yeah, I just want to make a comment. Each of the run. Go ahead, Al. What's fascinating to me is whenever we do these atherectomies, you pull out a little strand yeah, and it makes a significantly better image. Right. But operatively, yeah, what you yeah. remove is like a giant plaque. <laughs> so, sort of wonder, it works interestingly. <coughs> uh, I'm never really impressed with the amount of plaque relative to something operative, but right. it works just the same. Well, I, I always think it's a, it's a question of hemodynamic significance, right? I mean, right. If, if, whether you've done enough to actually reduce the gradient or increase the pressure. So, John, can you go over the new Supera? What size are you using? What length are you using? And uh, yeah, is the deployment So, they now have different? seven, seven and a half. Because these are, the deployment's the same. If you want to go to the front camera, you can actually see Dr. Herman's hands as a deploy. You can split, if you can split the uh, input one and the front camera, and then turn that. Um, actually, let's go to the split the input one and the overhead camera. I'll do that better. Make a better picture for you guys. Okay. Yeah. Where's your, where's your camera? John, where's your target at the back right. end? Where are you hoping to target up, up above? Yeah, well, in this particular case, um, let's see, there we go, there we go. So you can sort of see this kind of to and fro motion. This is a particular case. Uh, we had plenty of room. I'm not worried about crossing the inferior upper gastric or the, uh, you know, the deep iliac circumflex. So 
Uh, we just sort of want to leave a little bit of a gap there. Um, and I'm not even sure that's sort of so critical, honestly. You know, what we don't want is, you know, to leave an environment where we get a lot of practical reactions and aggressive disease in between. So uh, I think that's pretty good. You know, maybe we could have been back a millimeter or two. We actually, again, have a marker on screen, and we're just trying to cover half of the mouth of the placenta. That's sort of our goal. Same thing when we put SFA stents in. You know, the mistake that people make is they try to get a flush of the osteum, and then as the stents normalize, you end with geographic miss, right? So, um, same thing with this, you know, as he, uh, as he walks and moves, this will sort of normalize and probably shorten up a little bit uh, and probably end up being perfect. So, John, you know, as, far, as, as, you as far as vessel prep, what did you do? Other than the anthrax? Yeah, so we went ahead. Yeah, we did just that and seven millimeter balloon angioplasty. Got we it. did not use um, shockwave. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of interest in shockwave. Um, we don't have that in our uh, OBL. And, you know, all the data is very compelling. Uh, it's, I don't think it gains much compared to the data that uh, we've seen with uh, Kuhn's uh, study. So uh, just sort of adds to the incremental cost. There's so, not clearly a fine role for DCD, either with or without the superior either. That was not part of BMI. Um, so this is basically directional atherectomy, uh, either guided, and then we went ahead and uh, uh, ballooned, and that was the plainest. So you would anybody on the, the, just a question for the panel, John, would anybody in the panel marry this with a 7.0 DCB? Uh, or do you think we need more data before we do that uh, in terms of the drug coated balloon? We know the PESTO, PESTO trial is ongoing, so it's kind of going to be interesting what that happens. And intuitively for me, at least Brian, it would make sense to, uh, if you have a 7.0 DCB, to put a DCB to give a best chance of patency. Any thoughts on how you would handle this? You know, I don't, <clears throat> I don't think it's ever wrong to use drug. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the two mechanisms of, of failure are, are biological restenosis and mechanical, uh, you know, residual mechanical forces. And so I, I think it's not a bad I idea. I will say with the larger superas, and in general, when I use superas in more calcified vessels, restenosis it does not seem to be as big of a problem as softer lesions that I've done atherectomy or angioplasty on. So I don't, I don't feel <laughs> compelled to use DCB when I use supera simply because the results have been pretty good. And right. in, the, in those patients I use it on, it, it it seems like they need it a little less. So, so John, we can see the image. It looks fantastic. If you can do an IVIS, I'm going to go to another lecture and come yep. back right back to you. This is the IVIS afterwards. Obviously, that's the prior genetic stent. And this looks really good, I think. You know, uh, there's a little bit of plaque. I no longer sort of see that uh, flap or that tissue prolapse that we saw earlier. Uh, or, of course, the fund today, I think you just saw and then we're up into I was prepared to stand right away, and this is uh, really nicely placed. So, no out of it. So, uh, I don't see any residual moment. Remember, this is sheer, really compromised uh, initially. Uh, if we go to input one, John, did you do any post dilatation of the supera, or do you routinely post dilate? I, I did not. Okay. I generally do not. We'll let this sort of novel at the time. So, uh, then what we did is obviously we went ahead and we had to uh, try to get the wrong button here. We had to go ahead and retrieve our filter, so that's what we did here. Um, so that's the price. So we put down our uh, glide uh, catheter, and I thought I considered it a run, but we went ahead and retrieved that. And then we made sure that we didn't have any compromise uh, at the filter site. That looked pretty good. We looked a little bit uh, lower in the perineal. Briefly with CO2, uh, we weren't seeing it very uh, well. You can sort of see it's how it looks so funny there. But so I brought my, my catheter down to some contrast and looked fine. So I think that was okay. Uh, and then we just sort of checked on the foot to make sure there was no debris. And we knew from before it's a single vessel perineal runoff, which is why a filter was so compelling. So uh, this point, um, uh, we did a little bit of iliac. I don't remember at the beginning, we were concerned because there's something that got left behind. Yep. So uh, essentially we're done. This is CO2 run of the left groin. We're going to use a mixed device on this. I don't know if you want to see that or not, but um, you know, we think that's a good device for closure, uh, especially now patients that are setting with prior stent there. We put some contrast into the balloon so we can make sure we're speeding appropriately uh, when we do that. Uh, and we'll just go ahead quickly and do the main laundry. You're going to do that for if you want, or we can sign off. Well, and then we'll consider this. Uh, well, John, uh, you know. thank you. Thank you for such an exemplary case. Uh, I mean, it was really just phenomenal and great discussion. And thank you for the IVIS and everything.